We were seeing a world where over time, 4,000 American lives were being lost every day. GDP was collapsing, employment was collapsing. And we observed our health bureaucracies behaving more or less at normal pace, which is it takes five to nine months to get out a grant and to write the grant application could take more time yet. So we had a one page grant application team of referees that responded in days. We sent out the money in another day or two. You raised about $50 million for this? And sent it out very, very rapidly to top researchers who ended up producing a number of significant innovations. Joe Lonsdale, welcome to the American Optimist. I'm really lucky to be able to talk to Tyler Cowen today. Tyler is one of the greatest economists of our time, in, in, in my opinion, and one of the most influential as well. And thanks for coming down to Austin, Texas, and for chatting with us. Thank you, Joe. Happy to be on the show. You're a professor at George Mason. You're chairman of the Mercatus Center. Uh, what's what's your, your best-selling author, your blogs, and one of my favorite blogs for over a decade, Marginal Revolution. What, what's, what's your big focus now? What are, you, what, are you, what are you trying to do? What are you spending time on? I have a new book coming out in May, co-authored with a venture capitalist, Daniel Gross of Pioneer. And our book is on what do the social sciences know about spotting and identifying talent. Interesting about spotting talent. I, I spent a lot of time on talent on talent myself. That's the scarcest resource in terms of building things. It, it, what, 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 are there, is there a high level preview? Like, like, like what, what, what do you think about talent? Well, I can tell you some of the questions we consider. So which are the personality traits that might be overrated or underrated? How much does intelligence or IQ matter? When should you use talent scouts? Uh, what do men looking for talent typically get wrong about women? So how does gender play into questions of talent? Uh, what, what, what are a couple, of, a couple of those? Do you have any? Do you can tell us? What I do men get wrong about th that? There's good evidence that when men evaluate women, they make a few mistakes. First, they assign too much attention to the personality of the woman. So women who are perceived as difficult to get on with, men tend to discriminate against. So a given personality quirk counts for too much. Is this because of innate socio, like biological reasons that they're doing these things? That they I shouldn't suspect be? that's why. That's probably why. Hard yeah. to prove. Yeah. And then when it comes to intelligence, men compress the distribution of female intelligence. So the smartest women are smarter than men think they are. Actually, other women are better at judging the smartness of those well, let's, women. Let's get right into a controversial topic here because this sure. is fascinating. So I, so Larry Summers uh, got in a lot of trouble a long time ago uh, at Harvard uh, for suggesting that that there's a hypothesis that men tend to be more extreme on the intelligence spectrum. So we have a lot more men in prisons and we have a lot more men winning Nobel prizes. And part of that may be because men have a higher variance of intelligence with the, the one, one, one supposition is with the XY chromosome, men have one X, females have two X's. So even if women are as smart as men on average or even smarter than men on average, there's gonna be more really dumb men and more men on the other extreme as well. And, and now, but now you're telling me that, that, that men somehow impose that view based on their, is, is, I mean, is that, is that hypothesis true or, or is this what you're saying actually the case that men just get it wrong and assume that they're not as extreme? I think about it a different way than Summer's hypothesis. And keep in mind, he was summarizing a hypothesis of other people. If you read his words carefully, he was not saying it's true. He, he wasn't saying it's true. He's, he's, for it, but he's, it was unjust. He's saying this is a hypothesis someone else put out there. Yeah. Here's something that there's really good evidence for. Uh, women on average are more conscientious than men, and men have a higher variance of conscientiousness. So the least conscientious men wreck more destruction and havoc, right? So, so women have lower yeah, variants of conscientiousness. That means if you find a smart woman, you're undervaluing her as a man because you're mentally modeling her reliabilities sort of unreliable the way you might think about a man. Fascinating. So, the, so, so it may not be that the IQ is the higher variance. Maybe the conscientiousness is the higher variance. There's good evidence for conscientiousness being the higher variance. I've never seen good evidence for the IQ thing mattering the way that hypothesis exists. And that could be why there's more men in prison then as well. Or is it because oh, of more of aggression? Men are more violence. violent, more yeah. aggressive. But there are also more men who are highly extreme workaholics, right? Yep. So ambition has a higher variance in men. That's not synonymous with conscientiousness, but a higher variance there too. All right, well, let's, let's step back a bit. You're an economist, but it also feels like you're on a bit of a mission. You care a lot about pro progress. You and Patrick Collison talk about progress studies, and it, feel, it feels like you care a lot about Western civilization. Is that, is, is that true? Uh, I have a deep and abiding love for Western civilization. I've tried to travel to every part of it I can get to and learn and study its cultural products. And to continue that tradition is really, to me, the number one social, economic, political priority. And, and, and what do you think we need to do as a society to enable more progress right now? Because that's something you think and talk about a lot. Like, what are, what are the key things we should be doing to make sure we keep progressing? 
we just need to believe in progress more than we have been doing. So if you think about the 1960s, it was a fairly ambitious time. We put a man on the moon basically in seven years. Some people were skeptical, but enough people were, were confident we could do this. We expected rates of economic growth of 3% or higher. Uh, a new movie, if it came out, would be an event. It wouldn't be a sequel, right? It would be a new creative product. Today, most top movies are sequels. There are large institutions, often in government, but not only in government, private foundations, that have just become so hard to change, so stultified, so rigidified. And a lot we need to start over, build new institutions, and believe more in progress, that true improvement is possible. Uh, ambition can be highly desirable. Creativity, innovation, startup, entrepreneurship need to be far more culturally central. So they are already in your world, to be clear. And Austin is great for this. So you don't believe that we can go in and, and fix old government institutions? For the most part, we should, we should be creating new ones because the current ones are just stultified and broken and it's too hard to fix them? When, for the most part, that's true. Now, there may be some things you need to fix. So the IRS is broken. I don't know what it would mean to create a second IRS. You don't want to pay taxes to both. So mm -hmm. we need to fix a bit the IRS we have. But if you're, say, reforming science funding, I'm not sure you'll fix the NIH. Uh, you may need a new branch to do it. What, what, what if you could have competitive ones? What if you had three IRSs that each did different people and then you see how efficient they could be relative to the others and, and how, how, how easy they are to work with? Could you, could you have competition in government in these areas? I think we're seeing more and more competition across governments, across countries, and crypto and web 3.0 will intensify this greatly and it will be a good thing. That's across countries. What about, what about, with, what about within though? I mean, is that something that, so, so it, seem, it, seems like, it seems like competition in our society is what enables certain things to be functional because they have some competitive force. Couldn't we put that in place on all these things that are stultifying? A lot of these institutions are too broken and I don't think they'll allow it. I would make some, you know, modest, moderate changes to the, I, to the IRS. People who owe taxes should actually pay what they owe, but they shouldn't persecute people. There should be actual rule of law, taxpayer bill of rights, yep. and hope that patches up some of the worst problems. But they're not ever going to be that good, in my opinion. So in general, the way we're going to have progress is, re is you, think, you think more between countries is going to be a, be a better force than within, than within the countries for the, for the institutions that are broken. And increasingly across states and cities. So we saw this during the pandemic. States competed for people working from home right? Competed in terms of COVID policy, competed in terms of openness, obviously tax rates, amenities. And now that it's easier to move, this has all become more intense. And I think it will make an enormous positive difference for productivity and quality of governance, even within this country. And it's helped Austin. Austin obviously has been the big winner from all of this. And the big loser is San Francisco. Yeah, that's our theory of change. And my policy group is making the states compete in, in right. cities as well. And cities, Miami yeah. Beach and uh, Miami uh, are on the verge of being big winners. Maybe that's not as in the bag as Austin, but that's been more citywide than statewide. So going back to this idea of progress, you, you, you wrote a book called The Great Stagnation about a decade ago now, and you, and you and talked about looking for the root causes of prosperity. What, 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 what are the root causes of prosperity? You need to have a good underlying culture, which in my view starts with religion. You need to have founding myths about your society, which can be true. I, I use the word myth in a general sense. We Americans, I think, have some of the best founding myths. Uh, we are an open country that attracts talent from around the world, and we have been successful, and we have the roots to believe we can succeed. We need a better legal order, and we need for today's innovators not to be hindered and to be allowed to build new things, new institutions, new tech products, new everything else, better health care, much better education. I think we're actually going to do most of it, but with very bumpy roads to get there. So, so, so a lot of people would agree with legal order, allowing innovators to work, healthcare education. I'm curious about the, the foundation of society, the myth and, and the shared, you said you need a, you need a religion and, and a myth. Why, why, why is that? Well, part of the American religion, I don't just mean going to church, but it's the notion that working your way up is a good thing. Earning money is no shame if you've earned it honestly. Business is to be admired. On average, we have more of this in America so than in more most parts this, of Europe. This shared set of values is basically is what is, is some is set of saying. bourgeois values. I think Switzerland has them more strongly than most of the rest of Europe, and they are a wealthier and somewhat freer country. So you see it, the difference. Ireland has been acquiring them for at least thirty years. Now one of the richest countries in Europe. When I was a kid, Ireland was like part of the third world. It was a backward place you felt sorry for. Now it's richer than Germany. It probably has a brighter future. Wow. My ancestors fled there on my father's side. It was quite poor when, when my we My ancestors did too. 
I didn't realize it was wealthier in Germany now. And so, so when people are attack, attack this religion, then when they attack these shared values, there's a lot of people who believe the business should be just, you should be disgusted by it. You should be disgusted by people, by people who make money. These people are fundamentally kind of attacking the system that works then. That's a dangerous thing that they're doing, they're doing that. Correct. Now there is a lot of fraud in business and one is correct to attack that and send people to jail when necessary. But for the most part, everything around us has been put here by productive capitalists, by entrepreneurs, by innovators. And that's just all internalized to somehow your automatic birthright. And at the margin, business is someone who is harming you. And a society won't get further if that mentality is universal. A lot of our friends who listen are successful people. A lot of them really want to help fight for the progress in our society. What could people be doing to contribute to the, to the, to the positive side of this and helping our society progress? Well, continue to build out your business or start new businesses is, I would say, number one thing. But also look for causes you admire and trust and are willing to support and realize you cannot take your wealth to the grave. And uh, you need to be a part of this larger enterprise of helping to build a free society. Is, uh, and speaking of taking wealth to the grave, in Western civilization, historically, there's a lot of families who built up wealth over time and, and, and had some duty and some positive effects of that as well. Is that Did you think the fam family should be passing down some wealth and creating some longer term uh, duty there? Or is that really not a good use of capital? You think it's better if people are spending it all uh, trying, trying to fight you know, while they're alive? Again, it depends on, on your family. But my general intuition is to think you should certainly leave to your children enough so they won't ever be in dire danger. But uh, if they grow up too spoiled or they know their entire lives, they will inherit some very, very, very large sum. It's not necessarily good for them. They should have to find their own way in terms of being successful. Have you, have you studied this academically at all with the different families? Is this something that people have studied well? There's plenty of research on this. And if you look at a family like the Rockefellers, the Rockefeller heirs are not so wealthy right now. They no. may have more than other people. I think that's healthy, right? Circulation of elites. There, there, there was one heir, she got really annoyed at the family office and she gave all her money in the 70s to this random guy from Nebraska and everyone made fun of her. And it turned out it was Warren Buffett. So she, she's still doing pretty well. But I, I think it's true, my, 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 friends, my friends in that family, it's not, yeah, they, there's not too much money there. But there, there are some families, including here at this conference you, you and I are at with a bunch of investors where there's really hardworking people from the third and fourth generation and they're able to accomplish a lot based on that. So I'm, 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 I'm curious if it's, I'm sure if it's for some families, it's worth it to pass down that wealth. Because if you get, if you train and get someone amazing, sometimes it's interesting as a positive impact. It depends how you bring up your kids. Like I said, it depends on the individual family and just how they are born. Like what combination of which genes did they get? So it can work. Uh, but I would think a lot of the people you're talking about are people who on their own demonstrated their own excellence. They would have already, they already got the resources anyway, in some sense. Charles Koch's father was well to do, right? He was in the oil business, but what Charles did with it was itself amazing. But this, but this is a good example, right? Because Charles' father had, there was about 21 million revenue when Charles took over the business. Right. And I believe he grew it about 10,000 times. And, and, and if, and if, but if he'd had to start from zero, he might be at maybe a hundredth of where one one hundredth of where he was today, because because that's the way these numbers work. Which means he would have had much less impact on society, given what he's able to do. And if and if you and I agree that he's funding a lot of things that we think are quite impressive for society, that might not have happened if his father hadn't given him the business. His father imposed a very tough upbringing on him for the better, and he grew up in Kansas, which is in many ways a better culture. I would say this: the less we live in a culture of entitlement, the easier it will be to have your heirs inherit your wealth and not spoil them. You want, you want to have heirs experience some adversity if they're Absolutely. going to get money. So, so, so if people, kids have experienced adversity and brought up in a good culture, then the money might be a positive thing. A, a much more likely, yes. Interesting. So, so going back to the in innovation part of progress, what innovations excite you the most right now for our society? What, 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 what are you seeing that, 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 that you know, make you feel like things are getting a lot better? Right now it's biomedical technology. So I've received, like most of you, my mRNA vaccines. I've traveled a great deal and uh, have not gotten COVID. Basically, they work somewhat imperfectly. You can look at areas like malaria, dengue, sickle cell anemia. We seem to be on the verge of major breakthroughs, CRISPR, in all of these areas. And the notion that a young person today might live to be 130 is not at all absurd. So I'm very bullish on the science. I'm not necessarily bullish on biomedical companies as vehicles for earning money. Why is that? A lot of regulation, sales in bio, healthcare arena can be very tough and very labor intensive. So maybe more of the gains accrue to consumers than is the case in a lot of sectors. I think, I think, I think the best way to invest in it, by the way, is to invest in the infrastructure empowering these companies because there's a lot yes, of things helping them. Exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, so that's what I'm most excited about. But I think most areas, uh, what is called green energy, I'm not sure that's the right term, but that seems like it's going to work in you, some kind of combination. You, you wrote a piece about nuclear fusion recently. What's the latest on nuclear fusion? There's a new company called Helion. It's backed by Sam Altman. I can't judge the science of their claims, but they think they've made a critical breakthrough. I think at some point someone will do it, whether or not it is them. Batteries, solar, wind, the big problems will end up being the law, the NIMBYs, the regulators, not the science. As an, as an economist who understands a little bit about these things, uh, if nuclear fusion worked and the price of energy went way down, what does that mean for the world? Give people a sense of that. I don't think people have good intuition on what could happen if, if energy becomes very cheap. A lot will happen that we can't see. That's part of the miracle of the market, yeah. right? Hayek wrote about that. Yeah. But just imagine uh, any time you wanted to turn a desert into a green place, you could do it. And just, it would just, cost just, you just like that. Cost almost much, nothing. much less. Cost almost nothing. Any time you wanted uh, to cool off a warm climate or uh, heat a place and you know melt the snow off the so roads. So global warming basically goes away as any sort of risk at all if, if you have nuclear fusion. You Correct. Can, if you, pull out, you can pull out carbon very cheaply if you wanted to. With further innovations, transportation yeah. would be much quicker, right? Mm -hmm. So you could fly from here to Tokyo much or, more or, rapidly. Or zip underground. Really zip quickly. underground. Boring tunnels would become much, much cheaper. I think it's already be become cheaper. It's but... become cheaper thanks to Elon and his teams, but I think you can get it even much cheaper by, by, by order of magnitude, I assume, if energy is very cheap. All the changes people underestimate, and even if all you're using fusion to do is to produce hydrogen fuel, in a green manner, and then you use hydrogen fuel or something else. You don't have to power every single thing with fusion, right? For fusion to make the whole world green. It feels like if you have really, really cheap energy, this is one of the high X you say you couldn't predict, but I bet you'd be able to have the replicators from Star Trek as well, because it feels like that's a super energy intensive process to, to quickly put a bunch of things down. So, and computation yeah. would become much cheaper, which is also important for replicators. So it's mind boggling when you think through all the different advances and they would in turn enable further advances So say replicating things is cheaper. Well, you're going to get a lot more innovation in factories in non-energy areas, right? Yep. My friends are working a lot on this AGI stuff with open AI and with these other areas. And it's, it, right now it takes, I think about $15 million, $14 million to, to train these models right now. I guess, I guess that would probably be a lot cheaper too. If you, far, you know, cheap far energy. cheaper, imagine that cut, you know, by 10 X say, and yeah. I think what, what is called artificial intelligence to me, that's a misleading term. But that broad class of things seems to be going quite well with a lot of bumps in the road. Driverless cars will take longer and so on. But if you compare it to what people expected 30 years ago, we're right now ahead of schedule. Are you is that optimistic? Is that scary at all? If, if AGI advances so quickly that it, it, it you know replaces humans in some way eventually? How do, you, how do you think about that? I think new advances are scary. I'm not sure AGI is the scariest. The scariest to me is simply historically so many new technologies end up used as weapons. They become tanks, they become yep. machine guns, right? Uh, atomic bombs. So the new technologies we're developing now might be used as weapons by bad actors. But there's, there's bioterror, but what, what else is scary on, on that front? I think it's all scary, even cheap energy, right? Uh, if you can imagine a terrorist sort of carrying a backpack that is storing a lot of energy very cheaply, Got that it. lone terrorist could do more harm. Now, to me, that's an argument we need to be more open to immigration, to take in top talent, mm -hmm. to win this race, stay ahead of China. We're never going to beat China at top-down control. That's how they're doing quantum computing, AI, other areas. But I think we can beat them with more innovative business and being a way better country for attracting talent. Yep. We talk a lot about this in the defense world. Our defense world is still using the 1961 frameworks, which are very, very top down, which is from a time when we admired the Soviet Union and thought Soviet Union was a better way to run things with our elites. And, and we need to open it up and make it open infrastructure if we're going to win against China. And not have these 12 year procurement cycles with steps of bureaucracy along yeah. the way. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a huge, huge, huge problem. Uh, speaking of doing things fast, bottom up, let's talk about fast grants a little bit. Great. This is a really cool thing. I was a small, small funder of it as well. You and Patrick Collison launched a bunch of these things here. And uh, using a small team of scientists, you guys sent out first round in funding in 48 hours, 48 hours right away to the pandemic. Like, like what, what were you thinking? What would you, what'd you guys do? Well, we were seeing a world where over time, 4,000 American lives were being lost every day. GDP was collapsing, employment was collapsing. And we observed our health bureaucracies behaving more or less at normal pace, which is it takes five to nine months to get out a grant and to write the grant application could take more time yet. So we had a one page grant application team of referees that responded in days. We sent out the money in another day or two. You raised about $50 million for this? And sent it out very, very rapidly to top researchers 
who ended up producing a number of significant innovations. What, what, what were some of the results from Fast Grants? Like what, 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 what worked? The spit test from Yale, that was a much quicker, much cheaper version of previous spit tests, like more than 10x cheaper. We were funders of that at a time when the wealthy Yale University could not come up with the money because it was too bureaucratic. Wow. Uh, another example would be just tracking of new variants, which turned out to be incredibly important when Delta Wave came. No one was doing that. No one in our bureaucracy said, we need to fund the people tracking new variants. We sent yep. the money two, three days. Uh, there is an antidepressant called fluvoxamine. This is more relevant for poorer countries that can't afford vaccines. It's super cheap, uh, not many side effects of significance, and it seems to reduce hospitalization by 30%. We should be flooding the world with fluvoxamine right now. I hope we will do that. That was wow. another Fast Grants impetus. Wow. And, and uh, is, this, is this something that we should do more of in general? There should, is Fast Grants a model that we can copy anywhere? I think it's a model for a great number of processes. It was obvious to everyone the pandemic was a crisis. But if you're suffering from dengue or dying of cancer, th those are large numbers of people, right? Those two are crises. And we're treating them like business as usual. We're going to take our sweet time, just like the Pentagon with its 12-year procurement cycles. Yep. And we should be accelerating pro, you know, progress by, by multiples, as the tech world has done on other issues. We need to spread that to our entire approach to science. Yeah, a lot of the ways I measure companies I work with is the, is the pace of iteration and how quickly you get feedback and, and change and do new things every week or two. And then by big organizations seem to have paces of iteration in the months or years, which is not as efficient. And Sam Altman says he judges individuals by how quickly they respond to his emails, right? Maybe <laughs> there's something to that too. People tell me I spent too much time on email, though. There's a, there's a trade-off. Sam's get to read not going to tell much. you that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's in business. It's a very useful thing. I don't know if it makes me a very good economist. <laughs> oh, it's a, not, not be reading enough. I, I, along with Fast Grants, you have something called Emergent Ventures as well, which we want to transform how we identify and back top entrepreneurs. Tell us, tell us a little bit about Emergent Ventures. That's a program directed by me to find new young talent, not just entrepreneurs, but the public intellectuals of the next generation. We have, in essence, a one-page application form, decisions rendered almost immediately, no committee-based consensus. There's one evaluator, that's myself, willing to take chances. And in some ways, it's, it's a return to older models of patronage. Uh, we do this all at overhead of 2% without losing money. That's great. And other people are doing projects at you know overhead thirty percent or more. Don't tell me. Don't tell me my, my LPs are only charging two percent. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh no. It's uh, so so so. I mean, what kind of size checks are these? And a lot. I, I'd imagine even a small check could make a big difference in a poor country for some of these these young people. We have a, an offshoot project called Emergent Ventures India, which does only India. It's run by an Indian woman, Shruti. She's the sole decision maker there. A lot of the value is not the money, but you get people the network. The certification is very valuable and you encourage them to set their ambitions higher and be more aspirational. And most people, we found most of the value has not been the money. For some people, they need the money to take a year off, yep. cover capital costs, uh, but it's the evaluation that is helping them for the most part. What do you mean the evaluation, the feedback you're giving them? The feedback, but that they can go to other sources of money and say, I was selected by Emergent Ventures. Because, because Tyler Cow and Emergent Ventures selected me, now these other places take them more seriously and the network of the other Emergent Ventures winners they now have access to. We just had a meetup, 130 people came. Uh, it was absolutely exhilarating, and people have gone away excited, and you know they're working together more with that's, each other. That's really interesting that works in philanthropy, because you know, in, in my business as well, when, when a fund like ours invests in something, they can then quickly raise money from a lot of other exactly. friends and people, so, so you have the same effect in the philanthropic world. You but it only out. works that way in philanthropy if you design it to work that way. A lot of philanthropists, there's a bureaucracy, it goes through a committee, there's some kind of consensus, a, a risk-averse decision. Finally, after months, the check is mailed. No one really does follow-up. or And then yeah, it's yeah. just out there, and it sort of festers. And okay, it, someone has some money. And if people know it's a bureaucratic institution, they're not going to respect its decisions as much as one that's, exactly. that's fast and smart. And then if they want someone to help them, like whom do they email? Who, with Emergent Ventures, they email me. I respond, a la Sam Altman, very, very quickly. What, what, what are, can you tell us about a couple of the coolest emerging ventures that you've been involved with? Uh, Recidivis is a nonprofit that has gotten large numbers of people out of jail uh, during COVID times. But in general, they produce data. Who can you release from jail who will not commit a new crime? Clementine's going to be on the show. I was an early backer there, too. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. So uh, awesome. they, they've been an absolute huge success. Uh, the repurposing of Curative to do early spit tests. They needed money for materials. Uh, one Zoom call. 
They had money, actually in that case, in less than a day, they were able to get the materials. They ended up doing at one point in time, 10% of all spit tests in the United States. And, and, and some of these people are just young intellectuals who aren't doing anything innovative right now, right? David Perel, I just did an interview with him at this event. Mm -hmm. uh, I met him when he was 22. He had zero Twitter followers. Now he has 250,000. He has a highly successful, highly innovative company teaching people online to write that is proven scalable. And that's, you know, four years later. Wow. And you, so you, you gave him, you backed him early on. Backed him early on, certified him, gave him enough just to start at all, not a huge sum. And he's much wealthier than I am at this point. He's 27. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about universities. Sure. So we're yeah we're you know you're, you're a founding advisor to the University of Austin, which I'm which I'm proud to be founding. And uh, you know what, what what's going on in our universities? You, you you spoke about a little bit earlier. Like is, is university something everyone should be going to? How should we be thinking of them right now? American universities they're too stultified. They're too bureaucratized. Too many professors are only careerists. In some ways, that's as big a problem or bigger problem than woke. So they talk to each other. They fill out all the forms in life they're supposed to. They do everything they're told to do, but don't really have impact either as teachers or as researchers. Super risk averse. You would think a tenured group of people would be the biggest risk takers. They should be the courageous people in our society. And they're the exact opposite. Why? So why, why is that? What happens? I've never fully understood. The culture is so screwed up. The hoops you have to jump through to get tenure, it's so selecting for risk averse. It kind of teaches you to be risk averse for so long that you, once you're there, you're still that way. Huh? And you're a conformist. Now, conformity is not always bad. Like you should believe in Einstein's theory, quantum mechanics, whatever, because other people do. But yeah. you can't only be a conformist, right? So I think we need a systematic revolution in American higher education at multiple levels in multiple ways, including online, but also schools like University of Austin and in many different parts of our country. And we just need more people trying new things. Look, when the Rockefeller money started University of Chicago, that was a chance. The Vanderbilts helped to found Vanderbilt, I believe. Yep. On day one, what did people say? I like, oh, where's your faculty? Where's your students? They, like, come they, on, they, this is- Yeah, well, they, they always mock these things when they're new. Right, yeah. but we stopped doing what happened at Vanderbilt, U Chicago. Why do you think that happened? It's been, it's been like 80, 90 years, right? What's, what, what's, what's gone on? Politics and education, they're downstream of culture. We have ceased to valorize innovation, progress, economic growth, business, and we need more of that kind of orientation in higher education, whereas the current attitude is almost entirely hostile to business, as you well know. Should students still be going to college? Like, is this something that is needed? Well, look, it depends who you are. You know, it's a good thing Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates dropped out. It's also a good thing many others didn't drop out. Most people now don't go to college. College is not well designed for them. In an ideal world, I don't think we would have college as a four-year experience. It would be more like a GitHub page yep. where you've been certified in different ways, online, offline, University of Austin. You took two classes at Princeton over the summer. You lived a year in China, whatever. And certification itself would be a sector where we'll see far more innovation. Is that something we should be thinking about for University of Austin is a place where you can you have a page where it certifies you and all the different things you've done I mean, as opposed to just a degree? And encouraging students to actually do that and giving them the resources to understand, like, what's a good way to get certified? Where should I go? What should I do? With whom should I speak? One thing I'm curious about with universities is why there's not more relevant real life experience that then it gets studied in the university. <clears throat> you're, you're, you're a professor. Here's an example. I mean, I would love to get 30 young, bright students and I'd love to have them ha figure out how to, as one of the things for a course, open a ramen store in San Francisco as a small business and then talk about how hard that was. And they would give them some budget and, you, and you'd have them work on it. And, and just they can see the disaster of the 72 things that San Francisco does to make it impossible. Maybe you'd open one there and one in a place where it was really easy to do business and they'd report on it. And I feel like every one of those students having had to work on it firsthand would then, would then understand these things much, much better. Like why, why isn't there more real world experience taught in these schools? There's just multiple layers to that happening. So there's school accreditation. There's the fact that the certification market is not really competitive or innovative. There's the fact that it doesn't fit into typical university procedures, which are set around a series of well-defined courses held at the home base. And all those need to change. And when you have multiple layers of obstacle, right, to get them all to change takes way more time than for any one of them. To if change. you wanted to do a really exciting new course with some experience like that or another one, would that be really hard where you are? Because you're at a pretty cool place. Like, like how, how does that work? George Mason's one of the better, more innovative places. They actually welcome Mercatus with open arms. 
But to create a new course, I actually need approval through a committee that is attached to the state of Virginia and exists in Richmond. Wow, and really? there's a bunch of people on a committee. And furthermore, like University of Virginia, our competitor, will lobby that committee not to approve like a new degree program because they view it as competition. Wow. And they often win those lobbying fights. So I that's even, insane. This right? makes me even more bullish on the University of Austin. We're just not going to let them stop us from doing lots of cool things. This is great. If you're able to truly start over and just think in a normal way, like with Fast Grants, Patrick Collis and I, we just said, like, how should philanthropy actually be run? Let's just do it how we think it should be done. And again, there'll be different visions. Let them compete. To do that with a university, college, America, the world right now badly needs uh, since we're talking about universities, I want to at least briefly mention uh, the what we call the woke mind virus around here, uh, <laughs> which uh, you know there's the Wuhan virus, uh, you know, COVID nineteen, but then there's the the, the Wuhan and our universities, of which this seems to have emerged to come conquer our culture, and. Uh, you know, I mean, how, how, how do you how do you how do you see wokeness? I mean, you, you actually were, you've you've written about how woke CIA is maybe not even a bad thing, which is I'm not sure I agree with. But but is this is this a problem overall? And and, and how are you confronting it? Wokeness is not a thing I do personally. I don't do it in the institutions that I direct or am affiliated with. But I do think some version of it is here to stay, and we need to make our peace with that. And we want the better rather than the worse version. And the better version. What's the better version versus the worse that version? Every mainstream institution just has a ton of extra rhetoric uh, that they do actually succeed in hiring more women, more minority group members, more whatever it is they need to do. The CIA does need to recruit more diversely, is, is my impression, having been there and visited. But that said, cancel culture, uh, the negative side of woke culture is extraordinarily pernicious. But I also think it maybe has peaked, and you see this in my state of Virginia, seem to have become a totally blue state, Green. and they elected a Republican governor. It's not that Virginia loves Republicans. They are pushing back on some crazy pushing stuff. Pushing back on some crazy stuff. Uh, to, to, to me, a lot of what wokeness is, is it comes out of this kind of like post-war, post-modern nihilism, a kind of like the Foucault sort of stuff. The, 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 the idea that every, all of history needs to be interpreted as power struggles and a zero sum. And I think what, what wokeness to me is like intimately tied to a zero sum mindset. Is that is that is that something you've observed or is not, is not how you've seen it? I see some of that, but I also see wokeness as stemming from 17th century Protestantism and a certain kind of moralizing and part it's, of it's, our, it's, it's a Puritans as well. Basically, it's, it's a Puritans come back. It's a version of an American thing, but the side of our religious heritage that I am myself much further from. So that's why I don't think it's going away. I think it has deeper roots than just being some kind of continental mumbo jumbo. Got it. So, so, so maybe it's a, it's a mix of those two sounds. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, the, it's people there taking the Puritan streak and kind of pushing it on everyone. Though. Exactly. Synthesized with bad ideas about economics and other so things. So maybe we can rip out some of the bad ideas and some of the zero sum and just keep behind the positive parts that's pushing diversity and, and pushing at least. And at least, to actually yeah. be more inclusive. You look at yeah. you know, the woke themselves, like oh, Latinx. Actual Latinos hate that word for the yeah. most part, like 99% <laughs> of them. So to actually be a set of institutions, which I think is already the case, where say women are treated better, minorities have greater chance That's for good. advancement, so, to just be better. So we should, for those of us concerned about this, should be taking the positive parts of the woke side and pushing that. John Mackey calls this post-progressivism, where you take out the bad parts of progressivism and put in the good parts of our, of our markets-based society and just keep going forward. Is that, is that the solution? And we should be better at the business side of this, finding talent, giving people opportunity, Right. We should be cleaning up there. Yep. To some extent we are, but we could do much, much, much better than we're doing right now. That makes sense. One more one more talk. I just want to get your feedback on that. I've been terrified about recently is all these things coming out of D.C. recently with the they're threatening wealth taxes, and unrealized capital gains taxes. And much like nuclear fusion, I think people underestimate like all the positive things from that. Right. I think people underestimate all the negative things from some, from some of these crazy <laughs> proposals. And I'm, I'm curious how you see them. You know, I live right outside of D.C., so I hear all of these early on. They scare me. It's terrible, but there's a race going on. And the big thing on our side is they are not very creative. They're not that innovative. They're recycling a lot of old ideas. Does not make them less dangerous, right, to be clear. But I think there's better ideas, more talent, more inspiration, better culture on our side. How, how should we think and educate people about the relationship between wealth creation and inequality? Because that, you know, I build a lot of businesses and if I were to not build any new businesses next year and I go to the beach instead, we'd have, we'd have lower inequality. If I stopped building businesses, we'd have lower inequality. But, but so I, th I think this thing about inequality, people are just not thinking very clearly. Like how should we be talking about wealth creation and inequality? I'm not sure what works in focus groups, but just intellectually to think in terms of equality of happiness, 
America is a country that does pretty well in terms of equality of happiness. I don't think equality of opportunity as a concept makes sense, but just more opportunity outright. We could do so much to improve this country. It's nonetheless still one of the places immigrants wish to come for that reason, right? I think the notion of meritocracy is actually making a comeback. Uh, maybe you can't quite call it that. But what, should, what, should we, what should we call it now? <laughs> people want to hire other people who can get the job done. And if the world <laughs> stays more competitive, that force will Do become stronger. Do we have to stronger. be Straussian about meritocracy now? Is, there, is that the situation? We've had to be Straussian about meritocracy for some while, I would say. It's sort of a bad word. It sounds too Latin and airy-fairy. Uh, we need a better word there. So uh, are people in a free society happier than in a non-free society? The answer is yes. And like the pattern of income... There's going to be a lot of inequality the more global is the world, right? Because you're selling of iPhones, course. you know, everywhere, not just uh, to the, your local city. So that's just a fact. It's not going away. It seems to me part of the reason it's there, too, is that there's it's yes, there's more intellectual, conceptual leverage to build things than there ever was before. So certain people who know how to build well can build a lot more. Right. So, so it seems like there's going to be more inequality from a creative standpoint as well. I would also say I thought Biden with a Democratic Congress would do more bad things than what they actually will do. There's a, a lot they're doing I don't like, but it could have been much worse. And things like the wealth tax, I mean, that failed. Yeah. So, yeah. so you it's can not, take it's not, it's not as scary right now. You're a saying. cautious kind of comfort in that. All right. Well, I, well we, 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 I started the American Optimist, you know, to push back on this wave of cynicism we're seeing and pessimism that a lot of people have in this country. And you've written a lot about the conditions for innovation and for growth. And uh, so, so what, what are the core, what's the core part of your optimism? Like what makes you most optimistic right now? Look, the future is hard to predict, right? But if we were sitting here in year 1000 trying to figure out 2021, my goodness, this is so much better than what we would have expected. So at least you know it's possible. Then just devote your whole life, every year, all your, your waking energies in varying ways to actually doing it. You're not going to know how far you're going to get. But my God, someone's got to try and that someone ought to be you. So do it. And that includes building a successful business. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Tyler, for joining us. Joe, thank you.